you have is you have this history starting way back in the 1900s of regionalization. And regionalization is like Sandy. Sandy is huge in regionalization principles because they, Salt Lake City, derives so much benefit from belonging to the League of Cities and Towns. And the League of Cities and Towns is an intermediary. Thank you. And they'll come to everybody and say, hey, we provide all these services for you. And they will turn into this intermediary between these internationalist policies and Utah. And what happens is over time, all the cities become so integrated into the League of Cities and Towns that now you have a literal funnel of policy and law just coming straight through that league until you propose today that we eliminate it and people think that's crazy. I think they ought to eliminate 99% of what... <laughs> well, at this point, I'm more like a drug addict. Yeah. We're addicted to the services that are provided for us. So what are they going to do with the mafia? Well, I... I what are they going to say, a, you don't own your house anymore? You got to go to a 15-minute city or the jail. <laughs> I suspect I have an idea. If if there if we're truly in the middle of a cycle, a type and shadow pattern, then I think you could pretty accurately predict it. But depends on. I uh, actually part of that. Conspiracy theorists want to know. Yeah. <laughs> you can get started whenever you want. Okay. To. Um, you're asking for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I you want me to introduce you? <laughs> no, no, I mean, you can't if you want to, but... This is Phil Pot. So Aren't we excited, people? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you want to have an invocation? Yeah. That's a good idea. Anybody want to be there? I'll just... I'll just you know, you want to be in charge of that? Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, Dan. You want me to? Yeah. Sure. Dearest Father in heaven, humbly and prayerfully we come before thee. We're grateful for this day, and we're grateful for the, the Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us. We are grateful that we have peculiar knowledge of these last days. We're grateful for Morgan and his, his, his uh, all the searching, pondering, and praying he has done, and all the diligence that he has he has shown to figure out the mysteries of of the kingdom and mysteries of everything that's going on. Help us to be follow the Savior Jesus Christ at all times. Trust our instincts and for us to do our own searching and pondering and praying. Be with us this day, and we want to say these things humbly and prayerfully. We want to do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We can turn the lower lights on. Go oh, everyone. I'll be fine either way. because I They I've can to, see better without them, right? I've got to eliminate my screen. I can't see his face or anything. I know. We can't. Don't you worry know, about what I'm doing. Turn the... Turn, 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 turn just the... the, 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 the all right, quick question. Anybody not seen one of my presentations? Okay. Okay. Well, that's it. Everybody else has. I'll slow down. All right. I, I might pick on you a little bit tonight. Is that okay? Yeah. Me? Okay. I have two boys. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
what we call, you know, the spirit is simply entering into a state of comprehension of fourth dimensional thought processes. You know, I actually believe it's the spirit, right? But you read the scriptures and God appears to transcend space and time, right? So God says all things are present before him. Well, if, if you've got a document, you know, let's say a, the scriptures, and we jump out here, and we take a look at how many different sets of scriptures we claim within the LDS religion today, how is it possible to begin to comprehend all those? And then not only to comprehend the differences in each of those records of scripture, but how do you make sense of the interplay between all the different parables and stories? Now, I don't actually think we were ever intended to come to a perfect understanding because I think the author of this work is the person with the perfect understanding. But wouldn't we at least be expected to at some point in our time in our life transcend human understanding into these books? And I don't think that's possible without the Spirit. And I don't think that's possible without the light of Christ. So anybody work out? You ever go to exercise? Okay, and, and when you go exercise, what does everybody like to do with their music? Crank, crank it up, some heavy metal. My kids like rap, I can't understand that. But uh, I, my wife did CrossFit for a while, and I would notice that you, know, you go to the gym and everybody cranks up that awesome music, right? Why? It gets your adrenaline moving. Okay, so let's, Okay, I, I agree. So why though? Why does it do that? Just the kind because of the heat. It helps you to go to another level. Okay, so what if you if you analyze it, it, it creates endorphin responses in the body. Sometimes literal chemical releases within the brain, which turn into biological responses, and uh, you create a sense of euphoria. And that euphoric effect allows you to do things in a more motivated fashion. Why don't we do that with this? <coughs> Is it possible? And I'll tell you the experiment I did. I created on my phone, and my kids tease me for this. Oh, I'll show you. On my phone here is a playlist, if I can get to the right, okay, uh, called Spiritual Workout. And let me just, it's, I'll go to the gym. Here's the first song on my list. And my kids just think that's hilarious. Because who in the world could work out to that? But here's what happens. I tried this. And guess what happens when I start working out? You create from just physical exercise a natural chemical biological endorphin response. And the music also gets you into a space relative to that music. And every time I go work out and do this, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I remember a scripture. Oh my gosh, this. And my brain starts making all these connections. And I, I looked at my wife and I said, I wonder why that's happening. Right? So, I, and I'm not saying I know anything. This just could be mere coincidence, right? But we believe it works for working out. So why have we never become a people who take the same things we do in life to get motivated and bring them here. You see what I mean? I, I mean, I would say we do. I mean, we start our meetings with hymns. Yeah. And with the same playlist. Right. And yes. Certain, that is one of certainly the effects of prayer in our lives. Certainly it's invitation of the spirit. We'll do that spiritually as well. Yeah. So I do think we... we no, I agree so with you right. Practices. So what if, I guess my question would be, what if we started to do this in everything we did? At all times, in all places, right? I think what happens is the Lord's message is so omnipresent that you would have to turn it off. It would become so overwhelming in your life that you'd have to be like, hey, I, I got to go grocery shopping right now. And the Lord would be like, okay, close it up. But it's there still, right? It's still there. All you have to do is kind of get into that state to receive it. 
Um, I also think there's something to his proximity. Have you ever heard Elder Bednar say, uh, location is important for revelation? And I think his proximity, and I think we learned this in the Doctrine and Covenants when it talks about the Lord returning to the vineyard, draw near unto me when I draw near unto you, which, you know, DNC 101, <laughs> getting it right, is a cosmic parable of the Lord's galaxy, or galaxies, if you want to call it that. And his journey, oh no. Okay, well, <coughs> give me one sec. Oh good, we got to plug it. My daughter gets a hold of my iPad at night to trick her mother, and my wife will turn off her uh, phone, so she'll go grab this out of my bag and stay up at night. And I can tell when she's done that when it's a 10% higher chair to sit on. I've got one that's um, Yeah, maybe. Actually, thanks. So let me plug this in real quick. Okay. Um, I. I actually started all my presentations in groups about this size, and I really enjoyed it because it's a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more personal, and that's hard to do when you have a larger group of people. So if, if at any point in time this is boring, um, oh yeah, man, that's amazing. Wow, I've never had that nice of a chair. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Or if you have a question, just stop me. I'll put it down. Too. That's perfect. I have a suggestion. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Kind of a weirdo, but I'd like to hear a quick, your testimony quickly of the gospel before maybe, I mean, if you're okay with that. Sure. Um, boy, I feel like I should stand up for that. It's so informal to sit and share your testimony, isn't it? Uh, Let's see, where do I begin? Uh, my, I, I am hyper dependent upon the church. If you tried to convince me the church was not true, my entire being would reject it. Because my life as a kid was so fated for failure that without the church, I wouldn't be what I am today. My father was a drug addict. Uh, an alcoholic. My mother left him because of serial adultery when I was nine. I worked from the age of six. Uh, I had a paper route, which I would ride my bike into the city at the age of nine alone. I mean, who does that today? I was in the tree fields by the age of 12 during the summer. I hated it. I hated the work, honestly. I was not a hard worker. I'm, 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 I'm saying things like I was this hard, no, I was, I shirked work every chance I could possibly get as a kid. And, um, and I was in scouts. And scouting was directly tied to the church in Oregon. And I went to seminary. And my mom made me go to church on Sunday. I couldn't wait to leave my hometown. I went to Rick's College. Right, you see what's happening in my life. Everything good in my life came from the church. And I went on a mission to Japan and Hawaii. Came home, met my wife at Rick's College. Was married in the temple. Moved to Utah. Um, so you see, the, the, for, the, everything formative in my life is of the church. And so when I come across people who are critical of the church that's it doesn't faze me at all because even if the church wasn't true which I completely believe it is I still want it to be and I would still participate because of how much good it has done in my life now as a result of all that right you could say well you know, this guy's hopeless but I I actually believe that the Lord wants you at a point in time, and I think this happened to me in 2020, which I've had many formative moments in my testimony, but one of the, well, God, now I'm thinking of all these things at once. Um, one of the things that happened to me in 2020 was because of these formative moments, 
I, I felt like I was having another one in 2020 when President Nelson asked us to <coughs> sacrifice something in preparation for the fast that we were to do on Good Friday during COVID. And, and that was a very special experience to me, probably a transformative experience. But, but now I'm feeling like I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on and on about that. And I, I, wanna make, I wanna simplify it. And I'm trying to think of how to do that. Because at that moment, I, I developed a testimony of the Lord which I had never had before. And that may sound odd to people that my testimony of the Lord started with Joseph Smith. And I knew, I felt like I knew Joseph before I knew the Lord. And I think that would greatly trouble some Christians in the world. But for me, it was profoundly important because Joseph Smith was this revealer of Christ in a modern day. Now, so, so having said all that, you know, what does that mean? Well, in doing these presentations, I can't tell you how many times I see comments on my videos. Believe it or not, I sometimes read them. I know I shouldn't. Where people will say, why are you doing this? You have no right to do this. And I, I think, why would, why would anybody say that? Why, why wouldn't we all be standing as a witness at all times and in all places, sharing our testimony, teaching what we know, meeting often, and trying to come to a better understanding of what the gospel is all about? And for me, I, I think that was the natural manifestation of my testimony of the church was when at the end of these series of events, and I would kind of start them primarily with, you know, as a kid, all those kind of traumatic things that could have been, that instead were turned into something good by my participation in the church to receiving my mission call from Ezra Taft Benson and not knowing who he was. I had no idea who Ezra Taft Benson was. I had no idea how important he would become to my political ideologies when I ran for the state legislature. Um, to Von J. Featherstone's talk at the <clears throat> MTC about Joseph Smith and what that did to me. So, okay, I'm blabbering. What does that mean? Well, undoubtedly, in my mind, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. President Nelson is a prophet of God. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles holds the keys to this dispensation. And those things are implemented to protect all of us, but they do not mean that we as men should not be standing up. Well, ladies, I can't speak as to what you should do. I've never been a woman. But we men need to stand up and become a protector to the Church of Jesus Christ. And in 2020, that wall of protection, I think, came down completely. And the church was subjected for the first time in my life to absolute government intervention over the church, the closing of churches, the closing of temples, the closing of seminaries, uh, forced vaccinations, and if not forced vaccinations, compulsory vaccinations uh, for the purpose of travel, due process, and participation in society. That's the end. That's the end as we know it. And my first inclination was a testimony of politics. Go get politically active. And that's when I got my testimony of Christ. In 2020, when I decided, should I go to politics or should I do something like this? And uh, the answer was just so obvious at the time. Like politics was going to fail. And the only way to get people prepared for the second coming was to teach them Christ. And then I had this weird moment. Again, it was like, and, and I'll be very frank about my testimony. I don't know anything. I've never seen an angel. I've never had the veil part with a, with a undeniable witness. Never. On the other hand, 
I have so scrutinized the scriptures that I cannot find a flaw. And this moment, after I get my testimony of Christ, probably about 2021, this profound thought comes to me. What if it's all fake? Now, that's not the profound thought. But it was, it was this understanding that with my life, if I was incapable of not believing in the church. And if I'm incapable of not believing in the church, am I capable of rationally thinking about the truthfulness of the gospel? And I would say the answer is no. Right? Because I'm too dependent upon it. So all of a sudden I went, I need to make a choice. Do I want it to be true? And my response was, absolutely, I want it to be true. And even if it's not, I want to spend my entire life trying to make it true. Because show me somebody who offers you more than Christ. Freedom, peace, eternal life, eternal joy, eternal families. And somebody said to me, well, well, that's not true. And I said, it's still a better offer than you've got. <laughs> they were a Buddhist. Yeah. And I, I don't care if you want to be a Buddhist. I'm like, well, what's your offer for me instead? <clears throat> and they were like, what do you mean my offer? And I said, well, you're telling me mine's not true. My guy offers eternal life and immortality. What's that's your offer? <laughs> and he's like, well, it's not about an offer. And I said, well, you lose. I'm with this guy. <laughs> Right? Even if he's not real, I'm still with that guy. Okay, so... We're all shutting down. Yeah, we're, right. And, and for that moment was profoundly important for me. Because I felt like the Lord said, that's what I want. I want people who can have the entire veil closed and still say, I'm going to fight through that veil... For that thing because that's what I want to be true now I don't know if that's the path for everybody right but, but to me that that became a profound foundation for my belief in not only the church living prophets the scriptures but a deep deep love of the Lord and that makes it easier to do something like this right because how many times have we been able to successfully stand up and preach without detracting as individuals from the truthfulness of the gospel? Right? How many times do we see people who just jump off the deep end, decide that they want to be, you know, a leader? And I think the only thing that prevents me and anybody from doing that is a, an understanding of how he's the one we all need to get in touch with. And especially right now. Um, and what I found is in preaching the second coming, it's highly motivational. It's strange. And I, I've never seen people get so motivated so quickly as to gain a testimony of the second coming. Okay. Sorry. I, I feel like that's... I normally don't do that, so I'm not very good at it. Can I say something? I've always believed in the church because of Doctrine and Covenants, what it says. The glory of God is intelligence, rather, light and truth. I think, you know, like, the reason why I've followed you and a lot, I've listened to practically everything you have, is because I'm after what? Intelligence. And the light being, again, the spirit and the truth. And I think, you know, the truth is... What I like about you, you've done plenty of searching, pondering, and praying. Because I think the scriptures painted out for like, that's how why we have the church is because Joseph Smith decided to what? Search, ponder, and pray. So, you know what's interesting about that, this obligation to search, is the other thing in relation to my testimony that I felt compelled to do was to prove out my testimony. So, for example, as, as members of the LDS Church... We have, if you can't take the LDS church and find it in the scriptures, it's not true. Right? I mean, how can you claim to be the true church 
and not be the manifestation of everything in the scriptures. And so part of what I started to do was to take the scriptures and to literally do what Nephi did and liken it unto myself, my politi political experience, my legal experience, and my membership in the church. And what I found was so profound to me because I, I felt like, was it Alma? Where that he says they could not, dis or was it Nephi? They could not disbelieve his word. And I was like, I want to be able to do that. And what I found is that I felt like I came to a point where I could do that, but I, I can't make you believe, right? I can only show you the thing. You can't deny what it says. You can only deny the conclusion that I derived from the words. And, and that became a, a powerful witness for me because what happened to me over time is... Once you start to see the scriptures from the perspective of the second coming, things happen that are impossible, right? You start to be able to predict the future and see the past. And that's odd because you're not supposed to be able to do that if we are products of evolution, right? So I'm not going to cover a lot of this with you guys tonight because I'd rather jump into the scriptures and look at kind of a story and see where you're at and where you want to be tonight so I don't waste your time. Um, but I, I find this statement very interesting. And if I liken this to ourselves, particularly as Utahns, we live in a very LDS state. So you tune into the weather. You can get on your phone and find out whether or not it's going to snow tomorrow. You can find out the weather in Hawaii if you're taking a trip to Hawaii. And yet, we don't have a local service relating to us daily the signs of the times. Why? Why wouldn't we? You would think there would be enough consumer demand in Utah to have such a thing. But we have nothing. And most of what you find, like, for example, if I go onto YouTube, I follow a guy uh, called Dutch Sense, and Dutch Sense uh, just covers earthquakes throughout, um, throughout the, the world. So where is, our, where is our service in the state of Utah for... Um, for the signs of the time. How do you get that? And maybe you could say, well, you go to general conference. Okay, I, I agree. Where, anybody been to a, a Super Bowl party? No. What happens after a Super Bowl party? Does the Super Bowl end? Or is there numerous talking heads who break down everything who play won? by play? Yeah, who want why they lost or who especially last Sunday. Right? Where's the LDS general conference version of that? We don't even care. We go to conference, we're like pat ourselves on the back, walk out, and we're like, we're good. And we go back six months later with no breakdown. Lately that's been changing because of a younger generation of LDS kids who are starting to do it. Um so so I love the Lord's ad, you know, kind of admonition against the Pharisees. You, you'll do all these other things. You'll break down all your football games, all your soccer games. You'll go to all your kids' games. You'll ponder on them for a week. Why did we lose? You'll comfort your kid when they lose. You'll take them out to party when they win. But what do we do about the signs of the times? <coughs> now, um, this is the part. I'm going to skip a lot of this, okay? Because you guys don't need this, do you? The, the Lord uh, breaks down, well, I'll give you a real quick rundown. The Lord basically breaks down what are the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees to his disciples. He doesn't make it real clear in the text of the New Testament, but it, occasionally he will say things like the doctrine of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. And, and I would say that is the, that is the Republican Party. Right? When you and I'm not a Democrat by any means. But when we analyze these two parties or factions or cultures which have so much control over the United States, 
The Republican Party is particularly dedicated to hypocrisy. Fiscal conservatism, for example, right? That's the, the Republican Party is the party of fiscal conservatism. And yet, how deep in debt are we as a nation? Uh, the state of Utah is supposedly dedicated to fiscal conservatism, but jump into the budget sometime, and you'll see that that hypocrisy is plainly manifest in that behavior. Well, what about the Democrats? The Democrats are a little bit like the Sadducees. Um, they don't know the scriptures or Christ. So who's more accountable? A group of Christians who claim to believe in Christ who are hypocritical or a group of Democrats who don't believe in anything at all. When you die, you die. Evolution's the way to go. Let's get Jesus out of school. Well, who's worse? Those with more light. Yeah, those with more light. And um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, I tend to think neither one of them believe in Christ. And neither one of them sell Christ, and neither one of them claim his name or do anything in his name. So why would I give my allegiance to either one of those? It doesn't make any sense at all. And the fact that America, and, and Utah in particular, has bought this dichotomy is very similar to the ancient Jews who were willing to accept the dichotomy of Pharisee, Sadducee, and the, Rome, the Romans will kill us if we don't do what these political factions tell us to do. Now, the Book of Mormon goes a little bit deeper into this philosophy, showing that the most offensive uh, types of people are ones who come out from us and or who, who are of our faith and culture and willfully turn against it and, and then embrace and preach the doctrines of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And to me, that's Utah, right? And, and the reason I use Korahor is because Korahor is exposed as a person who is lying about what he believes. Alma catches him and basically says to Korahor, you have become possessed of a lying spirit. And in this process, Korahor admits that he did in fact know the truth, that he willfully rebelled against it, that he sought signs in order to come out of his iniquity. And Alma says specifically to Korahor, all right, this, this is why I think Korahor was a covenant temple attending member of the church who turned away from it. He says, one, you've had the signs, two, you've had the holy prophets, and you've had the scriptures laid before you. That's not the type of thing you can say to an atheist who's never been a member of the church. Not only that, Korahor's consequence is what I think has happened to us as members of the church, except it's a parable. The prophets have been struck dumb on our behalf because we are not worthy to have them speak clearly to us. And so what happens is President Nelson has to get up in front of us in general <coughs> conference and very carefully guard his words and, and put little footnotes in his talk for those who are willing to see and hear. And otherwise, general conference is very <coughs> general. general, very mellow. And what I hear is I hear people say, well, I can't, and I'm, I'm one of these people, I used to do this, I can't believe they don't say more. But I think this is why. I don't think the story of Korahor is given to us so we can condemn Korahor. It's so we can analyze it and say, have we been struck dumb? Are we a people who have had signs enough, who have had all the holy prophets and have the scriptures laid before us, and have we instead sought after teachings that were pleasing to the carnal mind, that grant us worldly success, and we do this for so long, we start to withstand the truth and come down to believe in things that aren't true. Such that our entire culture now reflects who? Korahor. Right? So what are, what are the hallmarks of Korahor? One is possessed with a lying spirit. He doesn't believe in God. And he says there will be no Christ. That's public school. To a T, that's public school. And we send our children into an anti-Christ school where if a teacher dares to teach Christ, that teacher is censured, fired, reprimanded. Uh, but you can teach any doctrine 
from the philosophies of man as long as you eliminate scripture. So it, it's true that we may not have a lot of individual cohorts running around in the church, and we like to point at ones who have become disenfranchised from the church, but don't we in fact have a bigger problem within ourselves and within our culture because we accept a cohort culture and say there's nothing I can do about this. And so we continue to use the cohort culture rather than do everything we can to exodus from it. And yet, what's, what's the Book of Mormon all about? Getting out, no matter how hard it is. And you know, I, I've had people say to me, well, Morgan, you actually left where you live. Yes, I did. And, uh, but Elder Holland went to Europe and said, there's nowhere left to run. And I'm like, okay, but the whole Book of Mormon is about running away. Uh, when the time is right. But what if Elder Holland is simply saying philosophically stop running from the philosophies, confront them, and start the exodus from the culture and the philosophy? Right? What would happen to the schools in Utah if all the LDS parents started to say, I'm not sending my kid anymore. You, you've embraced the doctrines of Korahor, and this place is not safe for my kid. The legislature would be forced to change their tone in order to keep our schools open and fund them because the LDS people would demand a return to Christian values. But we don't do that. We don't protect the teachers, even. And you, you talk to the few remaining good teachers who really want to do something, and they don't know what to do. And then we tend to do what? We blame who? The school, the politicians, the teachers, the principal. The, the teachers, I did this. This was my life in politics. It's always blaming somebody else. Oh, and by the way, if you vote for me in higher office, I'll have more power to then someday save you. And so we create, we create false messiahs in politics. And then we blame them when they don't succeed. So, you know, what do you, what do, you do about that? Well, one of the things that we learn in the Book of Mormon is what does Moroni say? It's the Book of Ether. Moroni is capping off the Book of Mormon. He gets the gold plates. He says, man, i got to write this stuff. Uh, Gentiles, when you see what happened to the Nephites happen to you. Awake. Awake. From your awful situation. Yeah, because if you don't, you're going to be swept off the land and destroyed, just like his people were. And, and, and yet, you know, have we not become... Uh, the authors of this very situation. We have built up the secret combinations. We have supported them. We've allowed them to seduce our children, and including our adult children at colleges who are also antichrist, until our children, except those who are now rebelling against our entire society because our entire society is broken. And most of our kids though, have come down to believe in their works and join them such that what you're seeing on the news is rampant manifestations of mentally ill people. And the news holds up these <coughs> mentally ill people as the beacon of modern enlightenment. And you sit back and you say, that's mental illness, but you're not allowed to say it. So in fact, we had a, we've had a situation here in the state recently with a school board member who criticized a teenage kid mm -hmm. for, um, the, the teenage kids' gender confusion. Now, I actually personally wouldn't have done that, right? But it's true. Gender confusion is a mental and emotional illness. That doesn't mean you persecute the person. You love them and help them. But what's happening now is the entire legislature is censuring the school board member who made the dumb remark that was true uh, because it was made as a teenager, and now they're targeting her for removal because you're not supposed to say those things anymore. Now, yeah, I'm not saying that they are doing the right thing or not, but what a strange place we've come to when that's the kind of thing we're worried about in our state. You know, that, that's an odd place to be, and it probably means that you're on the precipice of total societal failure, because if that's what you worry about, you instead of, you know, uh, clean, clean environments like not getting your um, waste into your water system, are your rivers polluted? Are your cows okay? How's your food chain? You know, where do you get in your water? We don't, we're, not, we're not worried about those things anymore. We're worried about 
gender dysphoria. And, and that's, that's Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because what is Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah is it's not a story ideal. about a bunch of gay people. It's an ideal. Right. It's an so, ideal. Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah is a story about a society that has become so bankrupt and corrupt that you can't even walk down the street and exist in your home peacefully without crazy people coming to your door, without crazy people being broadcast onto your TV. And, and our society, I mean, <coughs> anybody spend a lot of time outside this county and then come back? You know what you notice when you spend a lot of time out of this county and come back? You people are crazy. <laughs> it, you drive on the highways, oh. it is mental illness. I, I'm, 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 you really think about this. No, it's true. I'm like driving 60 miles per hour and people are like, vroom, vroom, and you're like, I'm so sorry. What did, what did I just do to you? And people who are in such a hurry and so anxious that they literally feel the need to speed down the freeway to get somewhere. What kind of society do we live in when that's what the center of this valley is dedicated to? And, and you become so used to it, you don't even notice it anymore. No. Okay, look at what happens to him. This is Cora Horse Fate. Now, anybody watch David Butler's videos on the Stick of Joseph on YouTube where he talks about the Sermon on the Mount as a temple ceremony? It is amazing. Let me just... Let me show you why this, if you guys don't mind, let me show you why I think this is so profoundly important. It's 3 Nephi chapter 12. I would highly recommend listening to David Butler's uh, three-part series on the stick of Joseph where he talks about this. Look at this real quick. Now the difference in 3 Nephi chapter 12 in the Book of Mormon is a heavy emphasis on keys and authority. So notice verse 1, power and authority in the 12. Blessed are those who give heed to the 12. Uh, they are chosen to minister and to be your servants. And if you listen to them, I've also given them authority, the Lord says, to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. This is the power of confirmation, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then he says, blessed are they who shall believe in your word, speaking to the twelve apostles, because ye shall testify you have seen me. Blessed are they who believe. Notice the, the, <clears throat> the theme now. Okay, so we go from authority to what? And, and just look at the first few words. Being, becoming blessed. Blessed are you if you recognize the system the Lord has created. You know, blessed are you if you give heed to their words. Blessed, and then he's going to go into nine beatitudes, right? I think that's what, what we call these. Blessed are the poor in spirit. <clears throat> well, what's interesting, I'm, I'm going to show you one quick thing, just to try and get your mind to plant a little seed to go look at this sometime. Um, it, it's interesting that there are nine of these points. This is uh, an image of an actual place that used to exist in Ohio. And in the early uh, to mid-1800s, the U.S. Congress commissioned a survey team to go out and survey all of these mounds that pre-existed American colonization or European colonization into America. Is that the Hopewell? It's the Hopewell culture. And this is one of the Hopewell mounds that was in Ohio. It has since been destroyed. Uh, but notice how many candlesticks are on the menorah. Nine. Notice the compass in the square and the oil lamp at the top. This predates American colonization. Who was doing that in America? What I find funny is, you know, all the BYU Mesoamerican Book of Mormon theory professors, uh, I don't care if they are. Even if you believe the Book of Mormon happened in Mesoamerica, why wouldn't you look at that and say, we better go study that too? Because it appears to me the Lord might have had people in all sorts of places within South, Central, and North America 
And I would say as Latter-day Saints, we have a duty to study it no matter where they are. But uh, you look at the Beatitudes, and, and we've got some interesting places in the United States which appear to be ancient temple sites, which match a lot of the elements of the Beatitudes. So here we see the Lord appearing to invite his people to come up to him on the temple, recognize authority, and to go through some sort of interview or initiation to become a blessed people. Once he does that, he says, look, if you would like to be one of these people, I give unto you to be the salt of the earth, but if you lose your savor, and savor is not loss of saltiness. It is a loss of the ability to do the thing for which you were created. You can no longer fulfill the measure of your creation. So when salt loses its savor in ancient Israel, it is mixed with too much sand. And so the, the householder will take that salt, which has lost its savor, and throw it out the front door onto the path where it will be trodden underfoot because it's good for nothing. Because salt doesn't lose its savor. So, unless it's from that perspective. So here we have the Lord saying, look, if you're one of my blessed people, and notice this is, for some of you who went to the temple a long time ago, a lot of the younger ones might not understand this, this is a consequence or punishment related to covenant. We don't like that anymore. In fact, you've got a whole faction of people who are running around <coughs> raging against blood atonement and Brigham Young. Well, blood atonement is just the con uh, covenant consequence for failure to live up, and the Lord teaches that all the way back in Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and, and right here in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. The devil, uh, pay attention uh, the next time you're at the temple, you'll notice that the devil levels the same consequence at you. Right? Just pay attention, you'll see there are consequences to not living up to your covenants. And then he says, I give unto you to be the light of this people, so now you go from a blessed state right there, and David Butler does a much better job than I will, talking about the three different levels and how each level in here is an escalation in light, uh, going from peaceable, blessed, to light, uh, people of light, to people of wisdom. And so when we, when we look at Korah, I've got to show you one more because this is so fascinating to me. <coughs> So do we refer to the three key to Yeah, the three different three levels different of the in, of the endowment process, right? Celestial room. And what he points out is that Lehi and others make a really uh, strong effort to talk about the fall of Adam. Here is Adam. Adam falls down to the celestial level and the temple takes you back up. So as Adam falls down to celestial level, so the temple walks you back through celestial, terrestrial, celestial. And I I love this part. I, I've always wondered. Now, you guys know the temple ceremony is largely published online, right? Correct. I guess largely. Okay, so I, I hope you don't think I'm revealing things I shouldn't. And there are certain things I will not say. And I think you'll understand why here in a moment, why I won't say these things. But I want to point them out so you can go study them later and contemplate them the next time you go to the temple. Um... Remember where he says, okay, let's see if I can find it. I, I, my wife and I were talking about, okay, right there. We weren't talking about this one. I'll show you that in a second. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So that's, that's a temple covenant right there. And then he says, take no thought for the morrow. Well, you have to consecrate your life to the kingdom of God in order to seek it first and the only way you can do that is if you have the faith to put the kingdom of god first in your own life through consecration whether or not anybody else is living consecration right we tend to say well we're not asked to live the law of consecration yet sure you are it's on the website as one of your covenants it's right on the church website and you make a covenant to live it and the purpose of that is to dedicate your life to the building up of the kingdom of god well the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you can have the faith to take no thought for tomorrow and stop worrying about the things of this world because the Lord will provide for you <clears throat> then one more a couple more I want to show you okay 
Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye? Hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye. So you notice what he's saying is, if you've got something against your brother, you can't be a part of this united moment. Right? That happens in the temple. Get out of this united moment until you go fix your problems, and then you're invited back into the union of the saints. And then look at this verse 7. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about this from a different perspective. This is uh, from, that way I can say things without saying things. The Zoroastrians were a real problem in the book of Ezekiel. Because the Zoroastrians were doing this thing called putting the branch to their nose. And in the Zoroastrian religion, if I were to pull up a Zoroastrian relief from the Assyrian or Babylonian, I think it's the Babylonian Empire maybe, uh, it shows a guy, one of the reliefs, holding a stick, standing at a veil, about ready to knock on it. Okay, that's the Zoroastrian imagery. And the Lord condemned the Zoroastrians because they had corrupted that process. In one of the Zoroastrian writings, it says they would go up to the door and they would knock upon the door in order to open a door to the other world. Okay, this is Zoroastrianism. You can read about this in Ezekiel where he talks about putting the branch to their nose. And so the LDS people understand what it means to seek, ask, and to knock, and to be able to then communicate with our Father in Heaven through a symbolic process of reenactment. And what, look at this one here. What man is there of you who, if his son asks bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks fish, will give him a serpent? Four things. Stone, fish, serpent, bread. When asked for something, you don't give another. You give the one asked for. Contemplate that in the temple the next time you go. And the stone being the foundation stone, which is kept in the Holy of Holies, the bread kept in the Holy of Holies, the fish or meat offering kept in the celestial area of the old temples, and the serpent, the Nehushtan, the brass serpent, which was also kept in the Holy of Holies. This is temple imagery. It's the temple ceremony. And it tells you all about the things you're doing in the temple if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, knowing that, Remember what the Lord says, I, now that you've come up to this process with him on the temple, he's about to reveal the temple ceremony uh, to his people, and he says, if you don't do this, you will be a salt which has lost its savor, right? Well, what's Korahor's fate? He's trodden underfoot like salt which has lost its savor. So what is Korahor? Korahor. Korhor is a covenant member, temple attending member of the church, who has turned against his covenants. And now, what happens to him? He literally dies in the story of the Book of Mormon, trodden underfoot. Well, why would we have that story? So we can criticize everybody else outside the church, right? <laughs> It's, it's always somebody else, not us. I don't know any core horse, so therefore I'm so glad I'm better than him. And what's the, who does that? The Ramiyamtum, right? You, we create this inability to go to the temple. We allow the, the proud ones to go, and we make it impossible for those who are poor of spirit to get there. But it was our duty as Latter-day Saints to bring the poor in spirit and to bring people up to the temple and, and get them to the presence of God. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop on that. But you see what starts to happen to a people who are a choice people, who start to allow antichrist philosophies to enter into everything they do. All you got to do is drive down I-15. Tell me how many signs you see with the name of Christ on them. Oh, you'll see more of the devil. Like, well, what, what we'd say today is, isn't it inappropriate to put Christ on everything yeah. we do? But isn't that... No. I've got to be careful here. Um, I didn't intend to make this a temple lecture. When, when you agree... 
to consecrate your life to the Lord. And you are asked if you, instead of consecrating, offer what the Lord has given you for money. Right? Nobody thinks that's them. But isn't, isn't, aren't all the things we promise not to reveal in the temple a representation of our time and our talents? So do we sell our time and talents for money? All the time. Well, if you're going to be true to your covenant, you don't sell it for money without standing at all times for Christ. When you separate those two, and you simply sell everything you are and have for money without giving credit to God, what have you done? <coughs> You've broken the covenant of consecration. And, and what we've become as a society here in Utah is a people who will sell our signs and tokens for money. All the time. And, and that's got to stop. Right? We've got to we've got to make this exodus from where we are as a people to a people who no longer pervert the ways of the Lord, but uphold them and become the salt and the light that the Lord has asked us to be. Now, one of the one of the things we've I, I felt like we really need to overcome that I that I had to overcome personally was I had to get rid of the spirit of Antichrist. And the spirit of Antichrist is the notion, if you study this carefully, look at every reference to the Antichrist in Scripture, the spirit of Antichrist is the concept that Christ won't come, or that Christ delays his coming. Most of the Antichrists in the New Testament came out from the church members. But Korahor has the same problem. He's Antichrist because he preaches against the coming of Christ. So whenever you meet somebody who says, ah, the Lord's not coming, yeah, that's the spirit of Antichrist according to the scriptures. And in fact, Jacob says that the people of the Lord are the ones who wait for him and, and feels the necessity to include for they still wait for the coming of the Messiah. Now this is about 590 years, 590, 620 years before Christ will come. And Jacob is saying, the real followers of Christ wait for his coming and look forward to the coming of Christ. So it doesn't matter how far you are out from that event, the purpose of being a follower of Christ is to wait upon him and to wait for his coming. All right, I'm not going to do that one. Okay, this one I do want to look at. Remember how the Lord says, without a parable spake he not unto them, but to his disciples he was willing to expound all things. What if the entire New Testament is a parable, including Judas? What if Judas is a parable? Um, what if the road, what we call the road to Emmaus, what if that's a parable? The road to Emmaus is seven miles long. It is with a guy named Cleopas, who means uh, vision of glory or celebration of the Father. Cleopas is surprised that the person who comes and approaches him and the other man, I think it's a man, doesn't know why they are upset. And he says, we thought that this guy, Jesus, who was crucified, was supposed to redeem Israel. But today is the third day. Why would that disturb him? The third day in Hebrew religion is pure death. I remember Princess Bride. It's mostly dead. <laughs> Once you hit three days, you're totally dead. And, and also, the prophecies were that he would rise on the third day. So Cleopas is disturbed because they haven't heard of him coming back. Because, of course, he's supposed to come back and do what? Save them. And... He says, I love this part. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day. And certain women came saying they had seen visions of angels and said he's alive. I like how they point out that it's, you know, women. The women, of course, aren't believable. <laughs> he's like, 
certain women, and yet it's a woman that the Lord appears to first. And he says, certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Guess what the Lord says to him? Oh, fools, slow of heart. And then the Lord proceeds to give what I would say is a pattern of understanding. If you want to understand the second coming of the Lord, he tells you how to do it right there. Start with Moses, walk through the prophets, and the scriptures will tell you all things concerning the Lord's coming. Now, I knew this before I found this. It actually took me a while. I, I only found this within the last couple months where I was like, man, if I just found this a couple years ago, it would have made my life easier, and I would have known where to start. But I had started to do this already back then, and, and let me show you how. I had come across some verses in Deuteronomy, and having been kind of a student of American history and politics, I knew there was a pattern here. This is the covenant given to Moses and to the children of Israel, and watch what the Lord says to them in DNC 28. Oh no, sorry, 29. I was in the other one. Wait, I do want to see that. Hmm, that's pretty good. I might have to use that later. <laughs> okay. The secret things of the covenant that God gave to Moses belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to our children forever. Okay, so who's the owner of the covenant? God made with Moses all the posterity of the children of Israel. Now, watch what he's going to say. <coughs> Where let's, let's say that somebody sees that, okay? And they say, I want to take hold of that covenant. But um, from an LDS perspective, you're not LDS. Therefore, you can't, right? Look what he says. This commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee. It is not in heaven that thou shouldst say who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us. Neither is it beyond the sea. The word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. So anybody, anyone in the world who was of the posterity of Israel could have approached the Lord and called upon this covenant at any time. Anyone. <clears throat> Genghis Khan. The aboriginals of Australia. The Europeans. The Englishmen. The Aztecs. The Native Americans. At any time could have done this. And who did it? Close. <laughs> it will. That, that is going to come. Watch, watch the layout. If you will call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So does the Lord drive Israel to the everywhere? South America, Central America, North America, uh, the, the Uyghurs of China. How about the, the Chine dynasty? You ever studied Chinese characters? Uh, I want to show it to you. Watch this. Let's go English to Chinese. The miracle of modern instant gratification through AI. High priest. Okay, see that? Da Ji Shi. That's high priest. So now we're going to go over here and we're going to flip these around. And we're going to look at it from a Chinese perspective, okay? Let's get rid of these two words right there. The two characters. See what the, that's the third character. It means to manage. I should have, um, I should have done something before I did that. Okay, so keep this in mind. Da, da, ji, shi. Well, what does what is managed, 
right? The last character is to manage. What is managed? Let's get rid of that one. The last one, we'll get rid of manage. Well, the grand festival is managed. That's what a high priest does. A high priest manages the grand festival. What happens at the grand festival? Well, let's get rid of grand, a sacrifice. So the grand feast is about a sacrifice, and the high priest manages the sacrifice of the feast. Sound familiar? That's, that's Hebrew. That's ancient Israel. How does China have Hebrew feasts in it? I could go through others. Uh, boat is eight people in a large vessel, eight mouths in a large vessel, just like Noah's Ark. So what we appear to have is Israel scattered throughout the world. And at any point in time, any of them have the right to call down the promises of the covenant. But what happens is one set of people only do that. And let me show you the year they do it. And then you'll know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. 1620. The people on the Mayflower will not step off the boat until they invoke the covenant with God because they believe that they are stepping foot onto the promised land. And so they won't get off the boat until they sign the Mayflower Compact committing themselves and their society to God pursuant to the Deuteronomical covenant that God made with Moses. The Lord says, anybody who will do this and return to me and obey my voice, then I will turn their captivity. Does he do that? He does. He takes these people who make that covenant and by 1776, liberates them from all other nations on the face of the earth. He then says, after I have turned thy captivity, I will have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee. Okay, does he do that? Yes, he does. He returns. In 1820, the gathering starts, the church is organized. And by 1844, Joseph has laid the foundation of the restoration of the gospel. And in 1844, Joseph Smith will organize what we know today as the Council of Fifty, or Kingdom of God on Earth. And what's amazing about this year, this is recently released by the church in the last three years. And it's uh, the administrative <coughs> records from the Joseph Smith papers specifically about the Council of Fifty. And the church writes this. Right in the front sleeve of the book. These minutes were recorded by William Clayton. He was the personal secretary to Joseph Smith. And the church has never previously made these available for research. This just happened the last three years. On that same front sleeve, and you can, uh, I highly recommend the book, and a book by Jedediah Rogers called The Council of Fifty. It says, on the 11th of March, 1844, Joseph Smith organized a council that he and his close associates saw as the beginning of the government of the literal kingdom of God on earth. So what we see happening here is a direct fulfillment of Deuteronomy 28 and 30. And by what's interesting about 1843 and 1844 is there's a group of Christians in the Midwest who are preparing for the second coming of Christ. And they think the second coming is going to happen in either 1843 or 1844. And they're super disappointed when Jesus doesn't come back. Now, why would they think that? Why would anybody think that Christ is going to come back in 1844? Because of Daniel. What does Daniel say? Daniel says, from the decree of Artaxerxes, there will be 2,300 days of years before the kingdom is set up. So the decree of Artaxerxes, let's see if I can find it. I don't, I don't even have a calculator on here. How is that possible? 
The decree of Artaxerxes is, is in 457 BC. So what's 457 BC minus 2300? 2300. 1843. It'd be the end of the year 1843. What happens at the end of 1843? What is the actual end of 1843 on the Hebrew calendar? It's not January. April. It'd be April. By the end of 1843 on the Hebrew calendar, Joseph Smith organizes the kingdom of God on earth, just like Daniel said. And they missed it because they were looking for something different. So we've got some calendar issues we need to correct also, in addition to... Um, many other things relative mm -hmm. to our timing, but but when, when we correct it, we see that Joseph actually does organize the kingdom on March 11th in what would be properly 1843, because we, we start our year wrong. We're going to come back to some other calendar problems in a sec. Can I ask a question? Sure. Do you find any coincidence that, I just realized this when you put that up there, 1620, 1820, and then 2020. Right. That seems to have a unique pattern. How? Do you know what the Nephite life cycle is from the restoration? If you count the restoration as the Savior appearing to the Nephites, mm -hmm. how long do they have? Awful looking. They have about 400 years. Yeah, so that's before interesting. they're destroyed. I didn't realize this. I didn't realize that till. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. So Daniel, Dan, not only does Moses appear to have a lot to do with the, kind of a grand apocalyptic vision, where Moses spells out the entire restoration of the gospel, who is also involved in that restorative story in Scripture that you can think of? So if we look at Moses, right, and we say, well, it looks like Moses is pointing to 1620 to 1820. Is there any other prophet that's writing about that era of time? Very specifically. If I, if I were to say it was Nephi, would you agree? That's what I guessed. <laughs> you know, watch how specific Nephi actually is. I could write this off to Joseph Smith being a, an amazing historian, okay? But what I, what I can't... I could take Joseph and, and all day long critique him. But what's amazing is Joseph is going to bump. Let's say Joseph makes up the Book of Mormon. Right? <coughs> Joseph perfectly bumps up to Moses. How many people were doing that in his day? How many people have done that since? And he'll bump right up to Moses and he will assign to Nephi basically a detailed explanation elaborating on Moses 28 through 30. Okay, I think it is. <clears throat> Nephi sees the land of promise. He sees multitudes of people, as many as the sand of the sea, gathered together to battle, one against another, wars, rumors of wars, mist of darkness, right? Let's just go here. Now he sees the Gentiles, and they form a great church. And he's going to see some guy among the Gentiles, separated from the seed of his brethren upon the many waters, goes forth on the waters to the posterity of Nephi's brethren. Now watch this. I beheld the Spirit of God that it wrought upon the other Gentiles that they went forth out of captivity upon the many waters. Now my wife is related to a guy named John Lothrop, who, who is in captivity, literally, in prison in England, who leaves... Uh, and is told by the, the British government, you can either stay in prison forever, have us kill you, or you can go to America with all the other wackos. And he chooses to go over to America out of captivity, and he will actually be one of the progenitors of Joseph Smith and many other people. <clears throat> Came to pass, I beheld many, the multitude of Gentiles upon the land of promise. I beheld the wrath of God upon the seed of my brethren, and they were scattered before the Gentiles and smitten. Now that's weird. Doesn't that seem out of order? Because we typically assign the great scattering of the Native Americans and the genocide committed by the early Americans to the Trail of Tears. 
So what's happening prior to that? Anybody read 1491? It's, it has some entries by, uh, in, from Francis Drake's journal where he sails the east coast of the United States in the 1500s, and he sees entire cities and agricultural communities of Native Americans. And then he comes back later and they're gone. You know what happened? European disease killed like millions upon millions of people. And what's, what's interesting is that you have three different kind of not, not violent invasionary forces, but simply trading forces, the French, the English, and the Spanish. And they come into the eastern seaboard of the United States with the French going north, the Europeans kind of coming central eastern United States, and the Spanish going down south. And they don't kill people. We hear all the horrible stories. Some of them do, no doubt, right? <coughs> but they bring disease, and it wipes out the entire east coast of the United States, all the Native Americans, reduces their population significantly. Now, that's not actually one of what I want to talk about, but notice what he's saying here. George Washington gets a really bad rap. Because George Washington is given a new name by the Native Americans during the French and Indian War. And what happens to George Washington's new name is it gets a little corrupted because he is seen as kind of a, a, a uniting force between American colonists, English colonists, and the Native Americans at the time. But then he starts killing a bunch of Iroquois people. And what we don't ever study is why and who helps him. So notice what happens next. The Gentiles humble themselves, and the mother Gentiles gather against them. And there's a war. This is a, the Revolutionary War. Well, what happens before the Revolutionary War, according to Nephi? The seed of his brethren are scattered. So between 16 and 20, between 1620 and 1776, when do the English colonists go to war with the Native Americans? They kind of don't, except George Washington. There's the French Indian War, but guess who's fighting with the American colonists? The Iroquois Indians. They're good friends. In fact, they're so good of friends that there are Iroquois Native Americans who are celebrities over in England and make massive amounts of money traveling back and forth. You can find pictures of them. It's they're incredibly beautiful attire that they wear, and they become very well known. So when does that happen? Well, check this out. I'm going to show you a guy named Joseph Brandt. And this is what causes problems for George Washington's reputation. Is Joseph Brandt is a leader of the Mohawk uh, tribe of the, Ir of the Iroquois Confederacy. Okay, there's the Iroquois Confederacy. Does anybody know how that started? So five nations, later as the six nations, from 1722 onward, they were called the Haudenosaunee, meaning the people who built long houses, which is a whole interesting exploration in of itself relative to the Vikings who came over and built long houses way before Christopher Columbus got here. But the um, Confederacy is attributed to, <laughs> look at that, the great law of peace. Started by who? Hiawatha. Who had contact with a guy named the Great Peacemaker. <laughs> who would that be? George Washington. No, not, not yet. This is the 1400s. The Great Peacemaker cast himself off the Niagara Falls and resurrected himself three days later. Yeah. That's just a coincidence. And he tells Hiawatha to organize this confederacy, and guess how they do it? They all get together under a tree called the Tree of Peace, and they bury their weapons of war and make a covenant never to fight against each other again. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Now, why would I tell you that? Because <laughs> that covenant is sacred to the Iroquois, and this guy breaks it. He turns against it, 
And because he betrays the covenant of Hiawatha, George Washington unites with the other Iroquois nations and they go on a genocidal rampage against the breakers of the Iroquois covenant. And guess who's the most angry? The Iroquois, not the American colonists, because of what he has done to the Hiawatha covenant. Now, Hiawatha, this is sacred to the Iroquois. Look at the symbol of Hiawatha. Oh, seriously. It's the original American Constitution right there. And what happens, it's the Tree of Peace. It's called the Wampum Belt, and it symbolizes the covenant made by the Iroquois under the Tree of Peace, and that's Hiawatha's Belt. And because of the relationship that George Washington develops with the people who join with him and scatter the seed of, of Nephi's brethren, the remaining Iroquois tribes are invited to the Constitutional Convention by the Founding Fathers, and they actually go and participate. So Joseph gets that order correct if he's the author of the Book of Mormon. But what's amazing about Nephi is Nephi will tell <coughs> this story that Moses begins, and he'll tell it in a very detailed way uh, as part of the restoration of the gospel until you get to 1 Nephi 14, where Nephi says, I have seen a whole lot more, but I can't write it. Where is it? The spirit constrains him. The angel says, don't write it. One of the apostles will, will write the remainder of what you've seen. Okay, what does that mean? And think about the sophisticated understanding of the scriptures at this point in time. Most people I meet know to say John, but they don't know why. Why would he say John right here? What, so we, we got Moses, okay? Here's Moses telling this story. Here's Nephi picking up right where Moses leaves off, adding more detail. And now Nephi says, hey, go to John. So what should we expect to be able to do when we get to John? Pick it up right there. Pick it up right there. Now, how many Christian scholars have that sophistication since the 1820s? Watch how precise the Book of Mormon is in calling this play to transition from Nephi to John the Revelator. Eighteen thirty, right about where Nephi leaves off. The great wonder in heaven, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, organized on April sixth, eighteen thirty. About seven years after Virgo appeared in the sky in 1827 in exactly this formation, on the same day Joseph Smith got the gold plates. That's just a coincidence, right? And then Joseph organizes a crown upon the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Twelve Apostles, and places the keys of the restored church and gospel in the Twelve Apostles, just like John says. The Church of Jesus Christ is pregnant with a child, which will be born on March 11th, 1844, and be called the Council of Fifty, or the Kingdom of God on Earth. Thirteen years after Joseph Smith is born in 1805, Karl Marx will be born and will introduce a new philosophy, a red wave across Europe, dedicated to a thing called socialism and communism, which over the next hundred years will literally murder 100 million people in Europe and the Far East. <clears throat> the tale of this system, the tale of this dragon, which will be the author of the <coughs> system pioneered by this <coughs> anti-prophet Karl Marx, um, the dragon himself will draw a third part of the stars of heaven. How many are there? Twelve. Of the original twelve apostles, eight will leave the church and four will come back making it four who leave and never return, just like John prophesied. 
We always read that in the context of the councils of heaven yeah. and a third of those heavenly oh. like You're saying, yeah, it doesn't help. Maybe, but sure. But could, could it mean that? Maybe, yeah. But it doesn't say that, <laughs> yeah. right? Maybe. And in fact, the the mathematical formula to assume such a thing is blatantly wrong. If you write the mathematical equ equation one third part of the host. It's one third x of y, which is an unsolvable equation. It doesn't work. Now, that doesn't mean it's not true, and people haven't said it, but I would ascribe it mostly to cultural mythology, not necessarily doctrine. But I could be wrong. Do we, do we know who those eight are versus the four? We do. Mm -hmm. Actually, we, um, I, I couldn't name them. Will, uh, William Smith was one of them, Joseph's brother. And then I can't remember the other three. Don't tell them who the mob. Yeah, yes, they, they turned that. Hard against Joseph. Joseph Smith said, "Would you, would you leave middle ground? You can never go back to middle ground." What's interesting is that eight leave. So if Joseph's trying to fulfill prophecy, he's got to talk four of them into coming back, or he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the likelihood is ridiculous. Okay, so it happened. So in the end, what happened? Who, just remind me who, who all left. How many left? Eight of them left. Four came back. Eight of them left. Eight of the original twelve, 12. leave. The church and four come back. And, leave and you're four. saying one is William Smith. Yes. That comes back. No, it doesn't come doesn't back. Come. He doesn't yeah, he does not come back. Where, where can we find the um, original 12 words? It's actually on, in the gospel library. Okay. Um, in, on the application. Okay. And they have a whole article on who they were. I, I, I looked for references to each of them. And I just never you might also find them on Wikipedia. Okay, thank you. I actually have a presentation that has them all. And if I if it's the one I think it is, I might be able to show you before the night's over. Thank you. Okay, so what happens after Joseph organized the kingdom of God on March 11th, 1844, whose right it is to rule all nations? What happens to Joseph? Killed. He's killed on June 27th, 1844, and Joseph is caught up unto God in his throne. Then Brigham Young flees into the wilderness with the church, gets to Utah. Brigham Young says, This is the place. Now remember, this is all a heavenly <coughs> metaphor. <coughs> And John will end the heavenly example or symbol with Michael. Okay, how does he fix that problem for us? Well, he goes here. And he continues the story on earth with an eagle who helps get the church out to Utah. Well, the Council of 50 will actually write uh, an application to Congress for the right to go out to Utah and create a territory called the Territory of Deseret, and the Great Eagle will in fact facilitate the church's right to create the um, state of Deseret through congressional charter. Now the church, it says, will have a time, times, and half a time to be nourished from the face of the serpent. But the problem with that is... <clears throat> If, if you study Leviticus, the Lord says, once I take you into a land, you should declare a jubilee. And the church celebrated their jubilee in 1897. Elder Anthony Lund got up in front of the church in general conference and said, in 1897, this is our jubilee. So in Hebrew, a jubilee is a time. Two jubilees would be a times, and a half a jubilee would be 25 years. So you get 50, 100 25, which is 175 years from 1847, which takes you to 2022. Once you get to 2022, if this is a correct <coughs> interpretation, you should expect to see the serpent's attacks against the church start to overcome the church because she only has 175 years, and the dragon will then start to make war with the remnant of her seed. Because the, the dragon doesn't want the woman. The church is not the thing. What is the thing? Souls. Yeah, families, souls, the children of God. And the, and the church is just a facilitator of the exaltation of families. So and, 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 and just the dragon above was you equated that to the rise of Marxism and the communism. Yeah, I would say. So here's what I'd say. Lucifer is the devil. Right. But... The redness, the beast, is the new way of peddling the philosophy of the devil. 
And communism is a unique response to a, an era of constitutional governance and democracy. So you have this monarchy system before, right? And now the devil's got to adapt. You're turning governments over to democratic processes, constitutional processes. Republics. What's the natural response to that? Socialism and communism. Uh, instead of tearing down kings, you're now tearing down political systems and reforming them. It's really interesting how it all is parallel, but because times are different, Satan does the same thing, but in different ways. Right. Like, I mean, well, sacrifice to Moloch, right? Well, if you... Emulating babies, and then now... Oh. Dare we say it? <laughs> right. Abortion. Abortion, sure. If you... If you, um... If you consider God's work a marvelous work and a wonder, you've got to have an adaptation to that strange work. The Lord says he'll do a strange act. But what's your... What's your audible in that process as the devil? Socialism yeah. and communism. Right, because it's the counterfeit. It, 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 yeah. Opposition has to rise equal to. Yeah, and if you don't have a if you don't have a counterfeit, right? If you say, "Hey, I'm going to give you all a constitutional republic," and the devil comes out and says, "Well, I'm going to give you tyranny and oppression," people are like, oh, "I don't want that." So he says, "I'm going to give you a better constitutional republic. It's called communism. You should own you know means of all you know the story anyway." Okay, so. So John, John's basically going to jump from this very descriptive restoration of the church to what I would say is 2017. So we're not going to go straight to 2017 right now because we don't want to do that. We want to follow this process of scriptural revelation to our day because by doing that, what happens is if you can get in here and start to really identify plausible explanations for the fulfillment of prophecy, guess what you do? You narrow your window of the second coming. And now instead of you know, trying to do a shotgun approach to getting it right, you start to believe that, in fact, the Lord might actually want you to know very specifically when he's coming. So and, and I'm sorry. So what we just so Nephi though takes us to 1820. Or does it take us to 1844? Or I would say Nephi takes you to about. I would say about 1820 because here's what he does. He gives you a very accurate description of the founding of America, and then he says, "In Gentiles, you're going to prosper and become the best." which really happens by about 1820. We win the War of 1812. We kind of establish, arguably, we don't win the War of 1812, if you look at it from a financial perspective, but, but we win the War of 1812. We establish world dominance. And 1820, the gospel is restored. You see what, and, and so we segue really so nicely. that's not the Council of 50 years, so it is the, it is 1820, 1830. Yeah. That time frame, and not, not the restoration of keys, the passing of keys to councils. I actually think you twelve. I would say it does fall in here, but not with Nephi. Okay. Nephi doesn't Nephi. cover that. Fair. Okay. Um, John but then he, does. he passes it over and we're in twelve. And we're in twelve. Okay. And then I would say what John does is he passes it over to Ezekiel. And and specifically Ezekiel 17. And what what's gonna happen in Ezekiel is we're gonna see the church. From the moment it's leaving the Midwest to Utah, just because that's where John leaves us. He says the church goes out into this place, <clears throat> and Ezekiel's going to pick up at that place in Ezekiel 17. Okay, so the Lord says to Ezekiel, put forth a riddle, a parable to the house of Israel, and notice the, the first thing we see in verse 2 as kind of the... What do you call this in Star Wars? What's what, it's what Yoda and Obi-Wan are. Obi-Wan shows up out of the desert as a guide to a quest. And what do we get here? An eagle. What eagle? What if it's the same eagle from Revelation chapter 12? How would we know it's the same eagle? Well, look at the attributes of the eagle. It has diverse colors. 
if I were to take you over to uh, the Hebrew version of that, okay, let's go to Ezekiel 17, verse 3. I would highly recommend using Bible Hub. You can actually, um, I'll show you why it's so valuable. I'm going to go to Ezekiel ch chapter 17, and I'm going to go to Hebrew. Okay, and you see what I can do now? I can see every single translation of the Bible, including the original Hebrew. I'm going to go to 17 verse 2, pose a riddle. To the house of Israel, a great eagle full of feathers with various colors. Harizma, okay, many colors. Notice that now does it sound more familiar? A coat of many colors. So what what is Ezekiel trying to tell us here? This eagle, in some way, is marked with the sign of Joseph. From Egypt. Well, what, what would that mean about these people in this place? It has to be of two tribes. The colors of Joseph belong to Ephraim and Manasseh. So wherever we are, this place is relevant to Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, if that's not enough, look at look at the other places we see similar words. Over there on the far right, double embroidery, needlework, stones, raiment. <laughs> you see many colors, diverse colors. This is the, when the Book of Mormon talks about fine twined linen or exceedingly fine clothing, it's talking about one of two things, Babylonian attire or temple attire. And... And that's what we're looking at here as well. So these people are the temple people as well. A great eagle, the United States, full of feathers, still has the mark of God upon it because God founded this nation. He's going to take the highest branch. Okay, who's the highest branch? Ephraim. Yeah, I would agree. Joseph saw our day. Joseph in Egypt. Obtained a promise that out of the fruit of his loins, the Lord God would raise up a righteous branch, not the Messiah, but a branch to be broken off. Just like Ezekiel says. Um, there it is. But a seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins, and unto him will I give power to bring forth my word unto the seed of thy loins, and not the bringing forth of my word only, but the convincing of them, uh, and his name shall be called after me. So who is that branch? Joseph Smith. Okay, so now we know in Ezekiel, if we're talking about what Nephi is talking about, this is Joseph Smith. So now we know our setting, America. We know who, Joseph, and we know who he's interacting with, the United States of America. What's going to happen to Joseph? Joseph will be cropped off, carried into a land of traffic. The land of traffic in Hebrew is Canaan, or Canaan. Now look at Moses 6. Where's the original Canaan? Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. And Enos and the resident do of the people of God came out from the land which was called Shulam. Where would that be? You've got Adam. Adam is driven out of the garden. Adam goes and settles where? Adam on the island, east. Okay, we Missouri. Missouri. So where is Jackson Enos County. being driven out of? Where his father was. And so Enos's new land outside of where Adam is is going to be called Canaan. And what do we call Canaan in the old world? The promised land. What do we call the promised land here originally? Canaan. It's the same thing. It's a mirror image of the other. <clears throat> so Joseph is going to be in the promised land, the United States, and he's going to be set in a city of merchants. Where does Joseph go after he's kicked out of Missouri? Nauvoo. What's the original name of Nauvoo? Oh. Commerce. Commerce. 
the city of merchants. Mm -hmm. So Ezekiel's getting every detail right. Either that or Joseph is just an amazing strategist. <laughs> now, after Joseph, he's going to take the he seed. Might be. Yeah, he might be. <laughs> and if he is, I go back to my point. Then, I'm following that dude. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm I mean, it's amazing that like he had no schooling, right? And like, and then he's getting all this stuff right. And I'm looking at this right. point, I'm not even sure I could put this all together myself. So. Right. Good guess, sir. Good yeah. guess, sir. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so what happens to the posterity of Joseph? Okay, let's say the religious posterity of Joseph, the seed of the land, is planted in a fruitful field placed by great waters. Where did the saints go after Nauvoo? Great Salt Lake. And the Lord calls these saints by the Great Salt Lake the willow tree. And they grow, and then he calls their posterity a vine. What's amazing about that is the United States, as we know it today in Canada, was called Vinland by the Vikings. They were seeking the Vinland, the sacred land. And when they got here to America and, and up in Nova Scotia built these houses that they found now, by, built by the Vikings, which are sim strangely similar to the long houses of the Haudenosaunee Iroquois, um, they they called it Vinland and, and settled up in Nova Scotia. So we we see that. Oh, you know what? We should take a break for some. Food. No, I, I'm just. Oh, that's I'm actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> share the <made> food. <laughs> um, so let's do this. Let's take a quick break and go enjoy that because I. I'm glad that happened.